so let's um, get into this by telling you the kind of questions I'm going to propose and the uh, answers I'm going to provide. So how good are preschools at boosting cognitive skills? So-so, uh, and impacts seem to be smaller now than 40 years ago. What policy levers are available in early childhood? Well, we have funding streams. We can uh, fund Head Start and uh, pre-K programs and, uh, and child care subsidies at higher or lower levels of uh, funding. Uh, we can regulate quality through Q QRS, uh, or we can, uh, or and or we can do uh, curriculum mandates. What's the bottom line on them? Uh, Center-based care helps. This is uh, some of the things that Greg talked about. Uh, quality regulation doesn't seem to work, uh, and we're promoting the wrong curricula in Head Start. All right, I've made enemies already. <laughs> Are there successful models out there? Uh, yes, but not many of them. They aren't cheap, and they aren't in Tennessee. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's turn to these questions. Uh, how well do early childhood education programs promote cognitive skills? Uh, there's a lot more information about uh, cognitive impacts than socio-emotional impacts. Uh, we're building on the data set that Greg Camilli uh, and Steve Barnett used in their nice meta-analysis that was published in uh, um, Teachers College Record, right? Yeah. Um, so that uh, used uh, in data on early childhood programs up through the late 90s. We updated that to 2007. Uh, and I want to focus uh, first on uh, impacts at the end of treatment. I know the uh, uh, conference is on what happens after that as well, and I'll provide a little bit of data about that in a second. But let's just look at end of, end of program impacts. Um, if you look first at the programs that we all know about, Perry Preschool and Abbasidarian, uh, and average whatever collection of cognitive measures uh, they assessed at the rough around the end of their treatments, uh, there were big differences between the treatment group and control group. Uh, the, the vertical axis here is uh, effect size, the kind of effect size that uh, we've been talking about. So both Perry and Abbasidarian had close to one standard deviation uh, impacts, a difference between treatment and control, very large effects. What happens if you uh, expand this to the much larger set of uh, programs that have been evaluated uh, between 1960 and, 1997, or, and 2007? Um, Abbasidarian and Perry look like outliers, right? They, their impacts are much larger than uh, what you typically could get. Uh, the typical uh, impact is more on the order of 0.25 or so standard deviations. Uh, and what's a bit worrisome is that that uh, average impact seems to be declining over time. I suspect uh, what's happening is it's the kind of thing that Greg talked about. Uh, you're always comparing a treatment group with some sort of comparison group. And if you look at the conditions uh, of the comparison groups uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, um, the kind of uh, education levels that mothers had uh, for kids in these studies was more like eight to nine years. Now it's more like 12 years. Uh, child care options um, available to the control group kids uh, are much more plentiful now than they used to be. Family sizes now for low-income families are much smaller than they used to be. They used to be about six or seven uh, kids. So for a number of reasons, the kind of conditions faced by uh, kids who didn't get into the programs uh, has probably improved a lot, which raises the bar uh, for programs now to, uh, uh, to do better than. Uh, and I do think it's important for a policy point of view, if you're going to put a program in, you have to do better than what's out there now, right? So it's really a, a higher bar is important. Uh, but you do get this uh, decline, but you also get an average effect size of about uh, 0.23. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Boston pre-K. Uh, which uh, came in after uh, the end of our data gathering period, uh, it generated um, larger effects than what you're typically getting now. How about long-run effects of early childhood education programs? So suppose we take this same set of programs, not all of them had follow-ups, but take the ones that did have follow-ups, uh, and track the uh, impacts, the effect sizes, uh, with time since the end of treatment. All right, this is directly addressing the, um, the fade out or whatever you want to call it uh, issue. Uh, 
And it's puzzling. If you simply look at the cognitive impacts, uh, you get this pretty dramatic drop off, right? Within a year for programs that uh, go out a year after the end of treatments, uh, there are 0.23 differences between treatment and control groups at the end of the treatment. A year later, impacts are less than half that size, right? And a couple years later, it's fallen in half again, right? So that on average for cognitive outcomes, uh, you're getting this geometric decline in effect sizes. It's a huge problem. Uh, and uh, it's a huge problem that uh, much more often than not, the kind of intervention studies uh, that we generate never do follow-ups, right? So we know a lot about end of treatment, but we don't know much about what happens after that. And if you look at the evidence from uh, the studies that have followed their kids, uh, it's not very pretty. Um, but let's keep going, right? What about uh, much longer run impacts? And again, now we're reducing the number of studies down substantially. Uh, but despite this, this kind of decline in, uh, in cognitive impacts, uh, achievement outcomes and IQ kind of outcomes, uh, if you look at adult outcomes uh, like educational attainment and earnings and so forth, I think we know this from Perry and Abbasidarian that you do get um, uh, impacts even um, even in Head Start, if you use Head Start kids who were uh, in Head Start in the, um, in the 1980s for the most part, where you had enough time for the kids to um, age into their adult years. Uh, David Deming has a nice study. It's not random assignment, but he's comparing siblings where one sibling was in Head Start and one sibling wasn't. So uh, you're looking within the same family. Uh, you also get these, uh, these adult uh, differences between the kids who are in Head Start and not. Uh, not huge, but, uh, but quite significant and quite meaningful, right? So it's very puzzling. You do get a disappearance of a lot of impacts, and then for some, you get a reemergence of, uh, of impacts on different kind of domains. So that's, I hope, by the end of the conference, we can figure out what's going on. Um, what processes at work are at work? Um, I have a separate paper about this, and I can't talk about it. Uh, for more than uh, 30 seconds, but uh, you know, I think economists are very wedded to this kind of uh, Cunha Heckman skill building human capital model that if we can just find the right skill or capacity, uh, gratification delay, executive function. You know, it doesn't seem to be, uh, it may not be early math skills or reading skills. Uh, if we could just find the right thing, uh, boost it uh, for that year in pre-K, uh, then we're going to equip kids uh, to be more successful in school and be launched on these positive trajectories. So that's one view. Uh, another view, which comes out of prevention science, uh, is, is kind of a, you have to be at the right place at the right time with an intervention. So for early childhood interventions, it might be um, having the right kind of intervention that enable kids to stay on track in elementary school, all right, so that they don't fall behind so that they don't get placed in special education. If you can, or maybe they get into a gifted and talented program, right? If you can come in at that right time, uh, you get kids into good school structures that might take on a life of their own, right? Um, it works not only in early childhood, but you can think about uh, interventions that are coming uh, later on uh, in adolescence, pregnancy prevention programs, right? You want to have those at the right place at the right time. You don't want to have pregnancy permanently prevented for the rest of their lives. It just has to be at the, uh, at the right place at the right time. There's an interesting um, program in Chicago called Double Dose Algebra in ninth grade, where uh, they uh, gave kids who were, had low scores in eighth grade uh, two periods of algebra instead of one. Uh, and it generated effects that uh, persisted and uh, not only in math, but in reading and uh, had led them to have higher graduation rates and so forth, right? So it's kind of being at the right place at the right time. Uh, and it's, it's a different way of thinking about it than thinking that early childhood is this tremendously important period and if we don't get things right by the time kids start school, then, um, then there's not much we can do. Um, a third view that I think the Ramius will be talking about later is more of a sustaining environments view. Uh, you need to couple um, a high quality preschool setting with high quality subsequent settings. Right? That's the, the set of ingredients. It's kind of discouraging, right, because you're spending a lot of money in, in the pre-K years, and then you're spending a lot of extra money in the school years. 
uh, but maybe that's what it takes, right? So we need to think about the kind of conceptual uh, approaches um, that might sustain impacts. Okay, so let me get to uh, the heart of my talk. How much time do I have? I fear that I'm going to be, oh, you're not keeping, good, okay, good. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, these policy levers for early childhood education programs, funding streams, curriculum requirements, and uh, QRIS. Uh, funding streams, uh, we know we spend a lot of money on Head Start and, pre and state pre-kindergarten programs. 70% uh, of low-income kids, kids in the, the bottom three quintiles, middle-income kids too, uh, are getting some kind of center-based um, experience uh, in the year before kindergarten. That's much higher than it used to be. Uh, but it's still a substantial problem on Hispanics, immigrants, and rural populations where enrollment seem to be lower. Um, so we've got kids coming to the programs for the most part. How can we uh, make impacts as large as possible? And again, uh, I don't want to um, downplay the importance of socio-emotional outcomes, but we have a lot more information about, um, about cognitive uh, uh, kind of outcomes. So uh, curriculum requirements and, uh, and process quality. So uh, curricula, uh, we know in Head Start we're mandating a, kind of a whole child. I know not everyone's going to like that term, I guess, but these are kind of Piagetian, um, let the kids explore and try to support their learning. Um, alternative curricula are content specific where you're adding an explicit math supplement or an explicit literacy supplement to what's already there. Uh, and, then, um, and then there are curricula that, that local uh, schools and centers develop uh, that take on a variety of forms. Um, so in the whole child curricula area, the ones that are mandated by Head Start, uh, creative curriculum is the most uh, popular. Um, the high scope uh, prairie preschool curriculum is second most popular. Um, there's not much random assignment evidence on their effectiveness. Uh, we know from Perry that, uh, that they're a high quality implementation uh, in the 1960s produced uh, long lasting effects. We don't really know now what those uh, uh, impacts look like. Um, in terms of process regulation, 49 states have QRIS. Um, delivering these star ratings, one to five stars based on, uh, on assessed quality. Um, most of these programs uh, are run by uh, State Family Services Department, I think originating from a desire to make sure that the kids were in healthy and safe environments, uh, and not run by education departments where the interest may be in, uh, in school readiness. Um, there's no uh, random assignment evidence on uh, what the effect of having a three stars instead of a two star rating or five versus four, uh, but we do have studies that have uh, followed large numbers of kids um, who are in various kinds of, uh, of uh, early care um, settings and measure where they are when they come in in terms of literacy skills, numeracy skills, socio-emotional development. Uh, they take similar kinds of measurement at the end. So you can see to what extent are you getting bigger boosts, right, from five stars versus four or three stars. Uh, in my reading of the evidence, I'd love to hear uh, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I haven't seen any study that really shows more stars leads to more academic uh, improvement or socio-emotional improvement. I know Peg Birchenall has uh, a study that, uh, that finds a little bit of an impact, you know, 0.1 standard deviation under certain conditions. But, you know, the, the gap we're talking about is more than a standard deviation uh, in terms of scoriness between high and low income kids. So, Point one standard deviation uh, isn't going to do it in terms of uh, what we need to get out of our QRIS systems. Uh, all right, so what about type of curricula? And I want to spend the most time on this. Um, and I want to use the same data set that was referred to uh, earlier this morning by Barbara. Uh, it's uh, one of the first big random assignment studies that uh, the Institute for Education Sciences funded uh, in its early years. Uh, it is a curriculum evaluation study, and it was set up with many grantees, um, each doing its own thing. The kind of report that came out was grantee specific. No grantee really had uh, enough kids to, um, to say much about because they didn't have much statistical power. 
So what we're going to do is pool together uh, different grantees who are doing similar kinds of comparisons of a literacy curricula versus business as usual, um, a math curricula versus business as usual. So I'll get into the contrast in a second. But when you do this pooling, um, you have about 3,000 kids. All right. Now, um, Larry Schweinhart will say that the PISER uh, sites that implemented HighScope uh, didn't follow the full scope of the kind of professional development that was recommended. Um, I think it's best to think of this not as a test of the ideal implementation of, of a given curriculum, but of a, uh, a more real-world look at what actually happens when, um, you know, it's researcher-directed, so it's maybe even better implementation on average than what you typically get, but a typical uh, medium-quality implementation of these various curricula. All right, so what sort of comparisons can we make? Could different grantees were comparing different, uh, different groups. Um, some grantees uh, were comparing literacy curricula versus uh, the whole child, uh, typically uh, creative curriculum and high scope, right? So it's a variety of literacy curricula, some known to be effective, and some were being tested for the first time. So again, it's not the best quality literacy curricula, but it's a, an assortment of literacy curricula. Can they do better than uh, what's being mandated by Head Start? Uh, other comparisons that you can make from these data are between uh, literacy curricula and just what's out there uh, in the community where they weren't doing uh, creative curriculum or high scope. They were just doing something they had developed locally. So do these literacy curricula do better than just business as usual, what's out there? You've got uh, a comparison of a math curriculum versus uh, uh, creative and high scope. Uh, this is Prentice Starkey's uh, math uh, curriculum. Um, and then finally, uh, there are, in some sites, you can compare uh, creative curriculum with business as usual, right? This is the only random assignment evaluation of, uh, of creative curriculum. So what happens when we do this kind of um, look? And we want to see in these various kind of comparisons what impacts you had on both classroom quality as well as child outcomes. So let's look at quality first. So, you know, I apologize, I'm not doing Aaron Sojourner's formulas, uh, but I'm going to show you a few numbers here. Um, so here you've got 16 cells, and each cell uh, is a separate analysis of an experimental comparison, right? So the, the circle, the red circle, uh, is going to have a number in it um, that is in the Eckers column. Uh, across the top are different um, ratings of dimensions of classroom quality. I think most of you know the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale. Uh, it's a very popular kind of summary measure. Uh, the class wasn't developed when PISER uh, hit the field, so we don't have a class rating. Uh, there was uh, an observation of uh, teacher behavior rating scale, of literacy activities, of uh, uh, math activities, and finally there was um, the Arnett, which is kind of a sensitivity of caregiver interaction rating, right? And everyone is using the same rating. Uh, people were trained up in a, in a similar kind of way. So the number in this uh, red cell is going to show for the sites that were comparing creative curriculum uh, versus whatever was out there locally developed, uh, are we getting significant improvements in an Ecker score? Right? And lo and behold, the answer is yes. All these things are uh, standardized. So you're getting two thirds of a standard deviation higher Ecker scores uh, in the classrooms that were implementing creative curriculum versus uh, business as usual. Right? That's pretty impressive. So uh, next, if you keep looking across the bottom row, I know you're going to look elsewhere, but start with the bottom row. Uh, this is creative versus locally developed across all these dimensions. Those are pretty big numbers, right? So creative curriculum was two-thirds of the standard deviation better on the Eckers, half a standard deviation better on, uh, on math activities, uh, two-thirds or more on literacy activities, and almost a standard deviation better in terms of the Arnett uh, teacher sensitivity, 
right? So along a, an assortment of dimensions of classroom quality, uh, creative was doing better than, uh, than locally developed. Uh, if you go up one row uh, for the math curriculum, there were a lot more math activities, more than a standard deviation more. You'd hope that would be the case. Uh, in literacy, when you compare literacy with uh, either high scope or creative, uh, you're getting uh, something out of improvement, but there are a lot of literacy activities in those, uh, in those curricula. Um, so it's not a, uh, it's a, about a quarter of a standard deviation. Uh, when you compare uh, the literacy curricula to locally developed um, curricula, you're getting these much bigger gains in, uh, in literacy, half a standard deviation, uh, 0.83 standard deviations on the TBRS, uh, and then half a standard deviation on the Ecker score, all right? So on quality dimensions, uh, all of these curricula were doing better than the, than the comparison, right? Not in all dimensions, but so now I want to know, so what difference does it make for kids, right? And these, uh, all of the, the comparisons uh, had a similar um, literacy uh, assessment, math assessment, uh, they had a socio-emotional behavior assessment. Uh, one scale was positive behavior, one scale was negative behavior. So um, what about school readiness? Same kind of setup, right? The columns are different now. Instead of the components of quality, now we've got these outcomes, uh, a composite of the literacy tests, a composite of math, a composite of the literacy and math composites. That's kind of the total academic. Uh, and then we combine the, the social skills uh, measures because they gave uh, similar kind of uh, readings here. So these are summary measures of impacts on kids. And um, it's very interesting. Down at the bottom, remember how you had half a standard deviation, to a, a full standard deviation improvement from creative curriculum uh, on the, the components of quality? Uh, you have no impacts at all on any of these child outcomes. Right? So despite improving our measures of classroom quality, it's not carrying over uh, into improvements in child outcomes. And it's not that these are big effects, but just not quite statistically significant. These are zero effects, right? So that's, that's pretty discouraging. Creative curriculum uh, doesn't seem to do better than uh, what a local community can come up with on its own. Um, one row up, uh, you did get a, um, a boost in math scores for the, the math uh, curricula relative to uh, high scope and creative. Uh, for literacy curricula, uh, you did get a boost in literacy scores, uh, not very big boost in literacy scores. As, as I said, these, uh, the alternatives of, of high scope and creative uh, had quite a few literacy activities in them. Uh, but even, um, it's, it's a bit puzzling that you're not getting a bigger boost when you're comparing literacy with locally developed uh, criteria, but you're not. Okay, so can we do better than this? Uh, what if you built a curriculum around proven uh, programs? Um, we've talked about Boston uh, pre-K as a model. Um, I have a book, I have two books with Richard Marnane. First called Wither Opportunity, don't read that because it's about 700 pages and it's huge. Uh, but then there's a follow-on book called Restoring Opportunity, uh, which is just 140 pages and it's half of it's a summary of, of Wither Opportunity, but the other half uh, are case studies of programs, education programs uh, that have been proven in rigorous evaluations to, um, to be effective. And one is the Boston Pre-K program. I'll show you some of the uh, uh, evidence from there. Um, it's a very interesting story that we tell about how uh, Jason Sachs came in, took over the Department of Early Education, uh, and, uh, and brought in this curriculum that took building blocks and took the owls. Uh, it took a, a kind of a behavioral curriculum as well, uh, manualized it. They provided a lot of professional development, uh, $12,000 a year. It's not a cheap program. Uh, they hired coaches, really good coaches, who would come in and observe the classrooms and help the teachers out. So, you know, it's the kind of uh, situation that we all hope that uh, would be present in early childhood education programs. But the building blocks uh, for success, I think, were the fact that they use proven uh, literacy and math curricula. Um, so let's take a look at impacts. This is a uh, regression discontinuity study 
uh, that Christina Weiland and Hiro Yoshikawa have done. Uh, here you're comparing kids who've just completed a year of, uh, of Boston pre-K with kids who are just starting their Boston pre-K experience, right? Uh, and as you look across literacy and numeracy, uh, you see these differences. These are, again, standardized differences. Um, you get uh, one-half to two-thirds of standard deviation improvements uh, for the kids who are just ending relative to just beginning. Um, they're finally getting enough kids uh, who participated in lotteries uh, to get into the, um, uh, the program so they can do more of a random assignment evaluation, but this, this is, uh, is what things look like with this uh, regression discontinuity comparison. Craig? Greg, would you tell us what the scores are in the standardized metrics? Are these kids doing well, poorly, as well as the group differences? Um, these are standardized differences on these tests. No, I understand. Right. Are they at national average? Or above or below? Oh, um, no, 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 no. I will note that. Good question. I don't know if it's in the, um, in the, uh, the article or not. This is a, the child development article from 2012 or so. Uh, another interesting point is that uh, they evaluated not only numeracy and literacy, uh, but also executive function skills. Right? So uh, you can go in and do this pencil tap test, I'll tap twice, and the child taps once, I'll tap once, the child taps twice, the child has to delay the impulse to repeat what the, the tester does. Um, so working memory, uh, impulse control, these are the dimensions of, uh, and attention shifting are the three dimensions of executive function. Impacts were significant here too, they weren't as big, uh, more like a quarter of a standard deviation, a uh, fifth of a standard deviation. But if you go into these classrooms, um, the kids, part of the curriculum was to march kids through a very orderly kind of behavioral regimen uh, where they learned about the activity stations. And this is a very play-based kind of uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, but they learned to take turns and, uh, and do all the kind of uh, uh, self-regulation that you'd hope kids would develop. Um, so anyway, so there were measured differences along those kind of dimensions. Uh, what, Boston, what does the Boston Pre-K look like? Uh, we actually have a website for the book called RestoringOpportunity.com. You don't have to buy the book, but you should take a look at this website. We, um, we had money to do uh, six-minute videos of what these education interventions look like. So one is Boston, another is some charter schools in Chicago that University of Chicago runs. Uh, another uh, is the small high school uh, movement in New York City, which uh, in its latest incarnation has been uh, quite successful. So you really get an idea of what's going on uh, and what the common elements are. In all the cases, uh, there was a, a lot of support for the teachers uh, to implement an effective kind of curriculum, right? So the focus was on improving uh, the, the quality of what went on in the classroom. It wasn't buying the kids laptops. It wasn't, you know, uh, un unimportant things. It was making sure that you had this relentless focus on what was going on in the classroom to try to make those, uh, those learning experiences as high quality as possible. So um, a summary, uh, typical early childhood education programs generate fairly small impacts. Didn't really talk about the benefits uh, relative to the costs, but there are reasons to believe uh, that uh, at least for most of the programs that have long-run follow-ups, you might get uh, benefits that exceed costs. Uh, QRS quality systems don't seem to be very promising. Um, the, these mandated whole child curricula uh, don't seem to uh, be very promising either. I should say, uh, on a sour note to end, if you look at the PSER impacts that I showed you, uh, the follow-up in kindergarten showed no impacts at all, right? So it redoubles the importance of this conference for understanding what you can do in the early grades to sustain these, uh, uh, these gains. Uh, my money is on uh, full Monty curricular approaches like Boston, uh, but let us see what the evidence shows in a couple of years. Thank you.